Okay, so now we're going to look at the earliest finish time. So the early time uses a rule that basically you we kind of discussed this previously, but let's just go through it. So say we have an early time of the current vertex. So the what vertex we're currently looking at is going to be the maximum of the current of the early times of the predecessors. So whichever one took longest, that's going to be the time it takes for the early time of the current, because remember, you have to have all those finished beforehand. So again, going back to the example of D and B, D took two extra units of time, which means that the, the early time to finish for the next variable that, you know, that C was once D was over. So you have the maximum of the predecessors plus the weight of the predecessor and the current. And that is, again, how we set up our graph. So remember, when we set up our graph, we had, you know, if you're going from U to V, the weight here, that W, is the weight it takes to finish V, to get to V as being ticked off and finished. So that's what we mean by predecessor and current. You would have your U and then your V. So that would be U and V, because U is the predecessor there. So again, the whole idea behind behind early finish time is that we're going to look at, you know, the maximum of the predecessor's early finishing times plus the weight of, you know, your predecessor and current, that arc there, because it is telling you how long it takes to complete the job for V. Okay. Now, one of the things just to note is this can be written as a lemma, which is basically if you have a graph which is, you know, described by vertices, edges, and weights, and obviously it's a directed graph, but we are just going to leave that out for now, and it is a task dependency graph that pretty much tells you that it has to be directed and stuff like that, that describes a scheduling problem, describes a scheduling problem, And if we start at t equal to zero work, then the earliest finished in time, the earliest finishing time, tv, at which you're going to finish the task that corresponds to vertex v, is the weight of a maximal Wait, walk from S to V. Okay, so because the way that we wrote this out and we, the way that we described it, it is going to be the weight of the maximal weighted walk from S to V. Because remember, the maximal weighted walk is going to take into account, you know, the path where you have the highest numbers of weights occurring, which means it automatically takes into account which one is the max of the predecessors and it automatically takes into account the weight of the predecessor and the current. Just one thing to note. So if you were utilizing the form where you had S and you had the zero there, and then you get to A, and in other words, your weight of your edge is the time it takes to complete this job instead of this job as we're doing in all these cases. So the beginning, the one where the arc radiates out of, if it is writing it as that job, then this maximal weighted walk from S to V is actually going to give you the earliest start time, not the earliest finishing time. So again, that is what I mean by if you do set it up differently, you have to take that into account. So the mathematics is going to be different. So again, we have been utilizing the idea where we have our start, and then we have, say, a took seven units, whereas this one has the seven occurring over here. Okay, so when we are taking this one over here, where we have the start time, in other words, where the arc is radiating towards, that job's time is featuring as the weight of that arc, then this would give us our earliest finishing time.
and it is the maximal weight of the walk from S to B. If you are doing it in an other approach where you have, you know, again, let's just walk through this, where you have in the situation of A's time is only occurring in the arc radiating out, which means from S to A you have a zero kind of situation occurring. The maximal weighted walk from S to V is going to give you the earliest start time for A. Whereas, again, the way that we're doing it, it gives us the earliest finishing time for A. So again, the whole idea behind this is just to remind you that your definitions and the way things are set up is going to make a huge impact to what the actual theorems and definitions that follow this or follow whatever you did are going to have on the rest of your work. So that's one of the reasons why I do keep on mentioning this and bringing this up. It's going to have a huge impact in the total, you know, of how you describe this and what certain things actually mean. Okay, so we're just going to go back to the director graph that we drew earlier in our example when we had the toss. I'm just going to add the weights to it. So again, just reminding you that here I'm saying that if the arc from S to A is indicating the time it takes to complete task a. So we have that one is 12, that one must also be 12. And again, just take a note of that. So the, the way that we're writing this, the way we're describing it, the arc going into B, okay, is the time it takes to complete B, which means all the arcs going into B need to be 12, because that's the time it takes to, com um, to complete task B. Okay, so just be aware of that and make note of that. So when you're doing it, particularly in this way, where the arcs going into the vertex are going to have the weights of the time it takes to complete that vertex's task. In other words, by the time you then get to that vertex, you have done or you have finished your task. That means, you know, all the vertexes radiating towards B will have the same weight. And all the vertexes radiating towards A will have the same weight. And all the vertexes radiating towards, you know, F will have the same rate, G will have the same rate, and etc. So just bear that in mind. Okay, so I just want to take that away. And move on to adding in the rest of the weights again. So we have the 4, we have the 16, we have the 3, we have the 7. These are all 0. Okay, and we have the four over there. So now we have our director graph. So let's work out the earliest finishing times for the different tasks. So the earliest finishing times for the different tasks, obviously the starting one is going to be zero because it's literally just the start. Then what you're going to do is you're going to basically have zero plus seven, and you're going to have the earliest finishing time of A is seven units. You'd also look at so you're going to look at all the arcs radiating out of S first. So then you're going to go down to D, and you're going to be, again, 0 plus 4, and that's going to give you your 4. We're going to look at earliest finishing times, will always be represented by square brackets in this scenario. So just be aware of it. So the earliest finishing time, square brackets, and we also refer to it as ET, earliest time. Just bearing in mind, in a lot of project management courses and stuff, there's also the earliest starting time. So just bear in mind the differences between the two of them. Again, the earliest starting time would be something we are going to end up looking at. Or we actually, no, we look at the latest starting time. But it is something that you can look at, again, if you had switched the way that you represented your graph. So just bear that in mind and keep notes of that, particularly if you go look at external resources. Okay, so let's just continue on. So we've done both A and D. So now we're going to investigate radiate all the arcs radiating out of A and all the arcs radiating out of D. So we're going to continue on and we're going to be like, okay, we have seven. So that is the earliest finishing time of A plus the 12. But we're also going to look at the other arc that's radiating into B, 
which is the earliest finishing time of D plus 12, which is 4 plus 12. And we're going to take whichever one of these is maximum. So obviously in this case, 7 plus 12 is bigger than 4 plus 12. We should hopefully know that the reasons why. So the earliest finishing time of B is going to be the maximum of those. So it's going to be the 7 plus 12. Why? Because it needs task A to be finished and task D to be finished before it can even be started, which implies that you have to take the biggest one for it to actually be finished. Okay, so the earliest finishing time there is 19. We're going to then move on to the other arc. So we've looked at all the arcs radiating out of A. We now need to look at all the arcs radiating out of D. So we have also D to E, so we have the 4 plus 16. There are no other arcs radiating into E, so we don't have to do any additional checks there. So we know that this one is going to just be 20. Okay. Next up, again, we're going to look at everything on this level. It makes it a little bit easier if you do lay it out like this. You don't have to, but it does make it a little bit easier for you. So you're going to have 19 plus 4. Okay. And 19 plus 4 gives you 23. There are no other arcs radiating towards L. So that's the only one that we have to look at. So now we are going to go down and look at all the arcs radiating out of E. So we have this 20 plus 3. That's going to give us 23 here. There are no other arcs radiating into F. So we don't have to compare anywhere else. And then we're going to have 20 plus 7 here which is going to give us 27, okay? And again, just the way that I've structured this, it's in almost topological order where you have, you know, you have S, then you have everything that needs to be finished in the next layer, you know, everything that needs to be finished in the next layer. So all the dependencies of B and E are in the previous layer, and then you have all your dependencies for L, F, and G, are in the previous layer so it just helps just a little bit again you don't have to do that but it just is something to consider and if you go further on it's more and more useful and it's referred to as topological ordering okay so now we have l f and g we need to look at the earliest finishing time for t so in all of these it's going to be 23 plus zero which is 23 it's going to be 23 plus zero and then it's going to be 27 plus 0. So again, you're going to take the maximum of them for the earliest finishing time. And so the earliest finishing time is going to be 27. Okay. You can write this in table form. So you'll have early time or start is equal to 0. Early time for D is equal to 4. Early time for E is equal to 20 early time a is equal to seven and i think you get the idea of this so i'm not going to rewrite all of them down but that is just the approach and the way that you can do it so the earliest finishing time you're going to go through from your start you'll investigate all the arcs radiating towards for example a and you'll take the maximum of these summations to give you your early finish time for a same thing will happen for your d and your b and everything like that Okay, so in my notes, I bring this up at this moment in time, where once you have your earliest finishing time, you can work out your critical path. So you know that when you worked out your earliest finishing time, you were actually finding the maximal weighted path in your graph. So you were finding, you know, a maximal weighted path. Now, if you're keeping track of exactly where you were going, you would automatically know that the maximal weighted graph is from S to D to E to G to t okay and why did you how would you have known that is well you would have first done you know your a and you would have done your d and then you would have moved on to your b and then you would notice okay your d is impacting your b right so you would have had at that point it was either going to be b or e as your next critical situation but when you look at you know your b and your e you would have seen okay your twin your e was creating a bigger time period it was creating that 20 situation and so then you would have been like okay e is now my critical path well on my critical path so i would have been there and then i would have been okay now that 
and then I would have looked at, okay, E is definitely critical at this moment in time. And you would have been able to then go through the process of determining that G is critical as well. And you would have had your critical path as S, D, E, G, and T. Obviously, again, we are going to be showing in the very next section how you can find your critical path without, you know, analyzing this whole process. But the whole idea is your earliest finishing time gives you that weight of that maximal weighted path. So you'll have a weight of that path is 27. That is the weight of your maximal weighted path, which is the critical path in your graph.